Okay, you're all very welcome to our COVID-19 pandemic uh, quality and safety tools talk. Um, my name is uh, John Brennan. I'm a practicing general practitioner uh, and uh, also quality improvement faculty uh, with the Royal College of Physicians uh, of Ireland uh, and I'm an ISCOA fellow. Today I'm going to be taking you through lesson two, uh, which is all about uh, systems thinking uh, and tools that you can use and apply uh, to improve systems uh, at this incredibly uh, challenging time. Uh, so you'll probably recognize those of you that have already viewed um, Peter's talk. Um, this is the Systems uh, Engineering Initiative for Patient Safety uh, Model 2. Um, this is an underpinning uh, human factors theory for uh, systems design in healthcare. Uh, it recognizes that work systems uh, in healthcare are composed of people at the center uh, working in an internal environment um, in an organized way, completing tasks using tools and technology. Uh, obviously, all of this can be affected by the external environment, uh, as we're seeing at the moment during this pandemic. Um, these different elements then um, uh, perform processes uh, such as um, clinical work uh, to produce um, outcomes. Uh, and this model um, uh, also incorporates uh, a degree of adaptation down here um, so this adaptation is based on feedback loops and I would like to think that a lot of this adaptation uh, is all about uh, improvement and improving uh, the work system. Um, I think um, one of the quotes uh, I've had in my mind uh, over the last few weeks or one of the song lyrics that keeps coming up again and again is this one from, from Joni Mitchell uh, from her song Big Yellow Taxi in 1970. Uh, don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone? Um, and I think uh, the way our world has changed and so dramatically um, in the broadest sense over the last uh, few weeks and months has been uh, really quite remarkable and has really uh, brought home to us, I suppose, uh, what, what we had um, before all of our lives had to change so drastically. Uh, the same can be uh, said of our uh, healthcare systems also. So um, if you think about the system uh, that you had before um, for um, booking patients in for consultations uh, or examining patients uh, or how flow worked uh, through your emergency department, um, the systems that maybe uh, contained uh, some degree of waste uh, and or the systems that are now uh, completely and utterly uh, unfit for purpose uh, in the given time. Um, in healthcare, we're working in systems all the time from the level of the individual and what determines uh, how, um, how you perform in your role uh, through uh, collections of individuals working in teams in hospitals at ward level or clinical team level at department level. Uh, the meso system uh, that supports these teams, the macro system which may re represent the whole hospital, uh, the macro organization uh, and then the systems that are operational at network, district and regional level. Uh, systems that are probably um, having a much bigger impact on all of our working environments now are much more obvious at least uh, than they may have had heretofore. Um, I suppose the important piece in this model and as we are all experiencing at the moment is that a lot of what gets implemented um, in healthcare at times of crisis like this uh, comes from the network district uh, regional level uh, and where I suppose the real uh, core knowledge for improvement comes from is at the level of this clinical microsystem. So the people who are providing care at the front line and um, looking after patients in these trying times, uh, the people who are trying to operationalize the instructions uh, that are coming from, from, from that high up level, they're the people that are learning fastest um, from what works and what doesn't work. Um, and, and the people uh, we can learn a lot from when it comes to how these new systems we're all implementing uh, around the world to try and deal with COVID-19, how these systems can be better understood and iteratively uh, improved uh, to achieve higher quality and safety for our patients. Um, I suppose a, a core tenant of systems thinking uh, is realizing and understanding uh, that systems uh, are made up of processes and processes are designed uh, for and by people. Uh, so at the core of all this, um, even though terms like systems thinking can seem 
uh, sort of detached at times. Uh, we're talking about people and um, people um, working um, in healthcare, trying to care for um, other people. Uh, and we have to, to, to keep that uh, concept and understanding at the forefront of our minds when we think, when we think about these tools uh, and the systems that people are working in. Uh, one model in particular that I really like from the Dartmouth group, uh, from their microsystems uh, theory, uh, is one called the five Ps. So all of the work systems we're trying to understand at the moment, um, we should be thinking about them uh, along the lines of all five of these Ps. The first P is purpose. Uh, what is the aim uh, or mission uh, of the system we're looking at? And is that aim or mission uh, shared uh, in everyone uh, operating within that system? Uh, the second P is patience. So the reason for doing our work, uh, the recipients of our care, uh, the people um, who have the 360 degree view uh, of what care uh, is like, the lived experience uh, through the system uh, that we're using. Uh, what do we know about our patients uh, in terms of who they are, age categories, demographics, uh, comorbid illness, those, those types of questions, but also uh, what can we learn from them at this time, what works well and doesn't work well in our, in our system. Uh, the third is people. Um, and these are the people working uh, or trying to operationalize that system, the staff who take care of patients. Uh, what do we know about them at this difficult time? Uh, how are they coping? Do they feel supported? Uh, have they been redeployed to new departments and uh, new teams, new areas of work? Uh, how has that affected uh, their ability to complete their tasks? Um, and also then in terms of the processes uh, that they are trying to complete, um, you know, do these processes um, make sense? Are they uh, set up uh, to provide uh, high quality and safe care? Um, if we can understand uh, the processes as delivered by people, then we have a chance of improving the system. Uh, and the last P that we have to make sure we always think of when we're thinking about uh, our systems uh, is the patterns. Um, and by patterns, we mean, I suppose, what the system uh, outputs are, what they produce, um, what's measurable here, uh, how can we decide if the system is performing well or not, and if the changes we make uh, will improve the system or not. Uh, we're going to be talking um, in one of our lessons next week on um, making change, uh, effective change, uh, during a crisis like this. Uh, and this will link back in with this idea of, of patterns in our systems. Uh, so there are three practical tools that I want to show you now or share with you today um, that we use all the time in quality improvement and patient safety uh, to help us understand systems better uh, before we go about changing them. Okay, um, That bit is really, really important because if you start changing systems without a good grounding or understanding uh, of exactly um, how the system is producing, what it's producing uh, at the moment, uh, then you run the risk um, of waste, uh, waste in time, energy and effort, um, but also in waste uh, of goodwill. Um, so it's very important um, when we're all working in uh, very new systems at the moment, uh, there are going to be bugs there, there are going to be glitches, there are going to be things that we need to fix. It's very important that we try to understand um, these systems before, before we uh, launch uh, our, our, our change efforts to make sure that we're maximizing the impact of those changes. The three tools I'm going to take you down through now briefly are process mapping, uh, fishbone diagrams or root cause analysis is another name for that, uh, and also um, five whys. So, um, what is a process map? I suppose a process map is a visual illustration, I'm going to show you an example in a minute, uh, of um, work as is. Uh, so, a lot of us, if we sit down uh, to try and, and draw the processes we engage in every day, uh, will often revert automatically to work as imagined. Uh, so that is how we imagine the system to operate, how we imagine we do our work every day. Uh, it's very important that a process map, when you draw it, represents work as is done, as is actually done now or the real world. Okay, um, I suppose crucially uh, it's a tool uh, that helps draw out the detail um, often uh, in terms of how work gets done. 
uh, and how uh, the processes we've just been talking about um, look in, in real life and what the people driving those processes are actually um, doing. Um, they create incredible insight um, in terms of uh, actually laying down or, or mapping what's happening uh, and they can be a very, very effective um, tool of communication and engagement uh, when used in the right way. Uh, so, um, process maps generally have um, kind of four key symbols. Um, an oval uh, denotes the beginning or end of a process. Um, a square or rectangle indicates uh, an activity during a process. Um, a diamond indicates a question or decision. Uh, and arrows illustrate the direction of flow. Um, it's best understood by looking at an example. Um, so this is an example uh, of our new process um, in uh, the clinic where I work uh, for examining patients at the moment. So uh, like a lot of doctors around the world, uh, we're doing a lot more consulting uh, via teleconsultation uh, remotely. So that's either via telephone or video consultation. And that is helping us triage exactly which patients need to come for examination or not. And um, we have cohorts of patients for examination who have respiratory symptoms and may have COVID-19. And then we have patients uh, who are coming because they have other issues or problems. And a lot of those patients uh, who need to come for other reasons for an examination uh, are very vulnerable uh, people with comorbid illness and um, for whom COVID-19 could be a very, very serious uh, serious illness. So we need to try and keep those two cohorts separately. Um, let me show you um, our process uh, through, by using this process map tool. Uh, so up here on the left you can see an oval denotes that a patient uh, arrives outside our clinic. Um, they have been instructed uh, from our previous phone call with them that when they arrive they should phone reception uh, to let us know that they're here. Um, they phone reception, the reception immediately checks, is the doctor available now to take them for the examination or not? Uh, if the answer is no, the patient, and a diamond denotes a, a question, as we said, or a decision. Uh, if no is the answer, the patient is asked to wait in the car. Our waiting room is closed at the moment to avoid uh, transmission risk. Um, and the patient then will be phoned when the doctor is available. If the answer is yes, uh, the patient is invited from their car uh, and the doors are opened vo for them uh, internally uh, by practice staff uh, such that they are directed to um, straight away the consultation room without necessarily needing to stop to try and minimize time in the practice. Um, the doors are opened. Now, uh, we are operating two different types of consultation room at the moment. Uh, one is a, a clean room. So one is a room uh, that we're trying to see all our respiratory cases in uh, that, get, that is getting cleaned down regularly and clinicians working in there have to wear full personal protective equipment at all times. Um, uh, we will know from the phone triage call initially uh, whether the patient is a COVID-19 uh, risk patient or not. Um, if they are, uh, as I said, they're being directed or shown to the clean room and um, they're coming in uh, to a sink to wash their hands and we ask them also uh, to wear a surgical mask. Um, they're instructed on preparing for an examination. Uh, the doctor does the examination in full PPE and um, then again we have a decision point uh, or question is the patient clinically stable and the doctor examines them from a respiratory point of view uh, are they hypoxic and unstable if so we may need to call 112 and the paramedics to take them directly to hospital uh, if the patient is clinically stable and uh, then we ask them to redress and uh, we ask them to wash their hands again on the way out and uh, to doff their mask um, we again open the doors internally, so as the clinician, I'll open the examination room door, the reception staff are primed to open the front door, and the patient can then walk straight back out to their car. We don't have a conversation after the examination happens in the examination room because we're trying to reduce time in that room. The patient returns to their car, um, having been advised to await a call from their doctor, uh, and then over the phone, based on the examination, we talk about the treatment plan. Uh, and agree it. Um, on the other hand, if we come back up to this decision point here, uh, if it's a patient that doesn't have any respiratory symptoms or fever, is not a COVID risk, uh, they're shown to uh, one of our normal examination rooms. Again, they're asked to wash their hands on the way in. Uh, the doctor this time uh, will examine them just in a mask and gloves. They don't have 
uh, full protective uh, gown or, or full personal uh, protective equipment uh, and a conversation happens then in the room after the examination uh, on the treatment plan, how that's agreed and then the patient uh, leaves. Um, so as you can see uh, from this process map, uh, it is representative uh, of work as is done uh, at the moment in our clinic uh, in this new scenario. Um, you will notice also that this map is drawn from the perspective of the patient. Uh, so this is the patient journey through this process as opposed to uh, what the provider journey might look like, uh, which would be a different process, a different process map. Uh, again, this process has been honed and refined uh, several times uh, based on uh, the feedback of staff involved in the process, either opening doors or clinicians examining patients, and then also feedback patients have given us uh, as well on, on what's working or what's not uh, in this process. Um, even though I've displayed it in a slide uh, format here with arrows and, and um, you know rectangles and ovals and all that, uh, the most effective process maps are first drawn uh, either with a pencil uh, so that you can erase uh, and edit uh, or using post-it notes so that you can put post-it notes in or you can take them out, you can move them around and, and, and that sort of sort, sort of thing. Um, if you want to understand your process more from your process map, there are a couple of questions you can, you can ask of it. Uh, you can ask, okay, are there steps duplicated in here? indicating waste. Uh, can things be done in parallel? And in our process, uh, things are done in parallel where we have patients being examined with uh, no COVID risk in, in rooms separate to patients being examined uh, with COVID risk, like is happening in a lot of a lot of other healthcare facilities around the world at the moment. Um, you can also ask it, um, you know, are there unnecessary handoffs, uh, delays uh, or waits in here? Uh, and you can also have a look at it and see if you're happy with the, the order of the process. Uh, the second tool I want to show you then is what we call a fishbone diagram or root cause analysis. Uh, so uh, the issue at hand um, or aim, the problem you want to understand or study in more detail, uh, goes in the head of the fish uh, over here on the right. Um, the big bones then of the fish uh, coming out from the fish represent, I suppose, the big headings or categories under which you could understand this problem better. Uh, you recognize these headings, uh, I hope, uh, from the, the uh, Systems Engineering uh, Initiative for Patient Safety a human factors design model. Uh, so broadly speaking, we can divide the big headings in understanding this problem, uh, which is COVID-19 uh, break room transmission risk amongst healthcare staff. Uh, broadly speaking, you can underst understand it under the headings of people, processes, tools and equipment, organization, tasks, and environment. Uh, and you will see then the small bones of the fish, uh, I suppose, represent these issues teased out in a little bit more detail or more of the specifics um, around which uh, you may be able to base uh, change ideas or improvements uh, to reduce or mitigate the risk of COVID-19 break room transmission risk. So under the heading of people, um, maybe people uh, in their behaviors uh, are not social distancing or they're not practicing good cough or sneeze etiquette. Uh, from the perspective of the environment, maybe the break room is quite a small space. Maybe there aren't very many sinks or, or hand sanitizing stations um, in there uh, or at the entrance and exit. Um, what's the process through the break room like? Um, have you got kind of poor flow and bottlenecks uh, with common break times amongst uh, large groups of staff? Um, what is the flow like past uh, areas where staff are picking up, uh, say, uh, cutlery or are picking up um, items of food out of fridges and that sort of thing? Does that bring a lot of people together uh, at the same time? Uh, looking at tasks then in terms of reducing break room transmission risk, uh, is the break room being cleaned uh, adequately and often enough or are items being reused? In tools and equipment, uh, are staff bringing in uh, phones and ID badges that may be contaminated uh, and not decontaminated uh, before they um, before they come into the room. Um, and from an organizational perspective then, uh, is there a policy um, that governs how the break room should work uh, to try and reduce or mitigate break room transmission? Uh, or is there something we can measure to this effect? Uh, are there measures that we can introduce uh, ac across this issue that might help us determine whether the changes we're making are improving things or not. 
Uh, the last of the three tools then that I want to show you uh, is one we call the five whys. Uh, so this tool works on the premise that if we look at an issue or a problem, uh, we can work down through layers using that question, why, uh, again, to get to a, a deeper or root cause for the issue or the problem. Uh, so let's look at a COVID-19 pandemic specific issue. So uh, we have a doctor in training that's making uncharacteristic uh, basic prescribing errors uh, due to poor concentration. That's our issue. Now let's see if we can use the five whys, I suppose, to, to peel away the different layers here and see if we can get to the underlying cause of this issue. Okay, first why, they're not sleeping well, like a lot of people at the moment. Second why, they're not sleeping because they're worrying about work. Why is that? They feel unsupported in their level of decision making uh, with critically ill patients. Why is that? Um, their usual clinic team, clinical teams were disbanded, uh, they were redeployed, and there are now new supervisory uh, arrangements uh, in place. Why is this inadequate, um, or why is this uh, contributing to this problem? Um, because there's no established supportive relationship with the new supervising uh, senior clinician. Um, so this trainee uh, doctor obviously doesn't feel psychologically safe uh, when it comes to the treatment decisions they're making, it's affecting their ability to rest uh, and their ability to do their job well um, when they're at work. Uh, so our root cause uh, is that there's no appropriate new team induction in place. Uh, and if you look out for our coming talks, uh, you will see we have talks coming up uh, on, how to, on how to be safe. Um, and we will also be linking to uh, doctor uh, wellness um, and healthcare worker wellness resources uh, during this extremely trying time. Uh, okay, so to wrap up, um, systems thinking uh, and systems understanding uh, is all about people, people, people. Uh, people design systems uh, for people. Uh, processes uh, are driven by and performed by people. Uh, people care for people in healthcare. Um, so we should always be thinking about um, the people and especially the people at that frontline interface um, who know and are experiencing um, what work looks like um, in this new environment now. Um, it's very important also, as we said, we're seeing a lot of new structures, a lot of new systems, a lot of new pathways implemented at a, a breakneck pace to try and keep up with this COVID-19 pandemic. I suppose the key uh, thing we need to remember here is that what is implemented can be improved, uh, but to improve things optimally, we first need to understand them. Uh, otherwise, we run the risk, as we said, uh, of wasting energy, effort, and goodwill. Uh, thirdly, uh, when you're using systems understanding tools, always use a pencil, as we said, or post-its that you can remove uh, and be portable. Uh, the magic of a pencil, uh, when you approach another healthcare worker and say, uh, this is my understanding of, of what's happening here at the moment, um, or how work is done here, uh, or what this process looks like. Uh, can you have a look at this very quickly with me? Uh, does this reflect your experience? And the power of the pencil and the eraser is that you can there and then erase uh, what, what, what is not actually happening um, uh, as, as a frontline worker sees it uh, and draw it and get, draw, in, draw in again with that pencil. And you, what you will see is that this, the frontline workers then um, own uh, the understanding of the process. Uh, and, and, and that is because that, that is how it is actually happening. Uh, and as we said, be portable. Uh, so process maps uh, sitting on computer servers uh, or whiteboards somewhere uh, that can't be brought to where the work is actually being done uh, or at least alongside it while maintaining uh, I suppose um, uh, safety when it comes to transmission of infectious diseases like this. Uh, those sorts of maps uh, that aren't portable and can't come to those places uh, are, are virtually useless and, and don't necessarily serve the purpose they need to serve. Uh, so you need to be able to bring it with you to edit it uh, and keep it up to date. And that is so that you can get to the point uh, of recognizing uh, this idea of work as is actually happening or as is done, not work as is imagined or is drawn up uh, in an office on the other side of the building uh, or a government office um, you know, uh, on the other side of the country. Um, work as done uh, is core and understanding that uh, to, Im to improving things for patients and frontline providers so that you can get to uh, work as should be. 
uh, and finally then um, when it comes to systems understanding uh, it's important to think uh, broadly um, in terms of your five P's so as we said uh, purpose um, people patients processes patterns uh, and then uh, deeply in our understanding as well by using tools like root cause analysis and uh, five whys. Okay, so keep an eye out please for our upcoming talks and um, particularly um, in terms of um, how we can make effective change happen during a pandemic. Um, my contact details are at the bottom of the slide. If you want to get in touch with me, if you have any questions, um, you can do so through email or Twitter uh, as below. Uh, otherwise, thank you for listening uh, and uh, all the best. Stay safe at this very difficult time.